Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the HPD Mindset. This is season two, and we're kicking things off with neuropolitics um, for our HPD vidcast. So, without further ado, I'm going to launch right into things what neuropolitics are and um, who we are and what we're doing here. So, for those of you that have followed along with us, welcome back. And those of you that are new, we'll give a little brief explanation of who we are. My name is Michelle Martin Nigella, PhD in Behavioral Neuroscience and VP of Research and Innovation at HPD Research. And as always, I am joined by Catherine Ambrose. Catherine. Hi, everybody. Yep, Michelle did a great job of introducing herself. I'm Catherine Ambrose, the manager of Behavioral and Marketing Sciences with HCD. Really excited to learn about neuropolitics and HCD's stances and approaches, but using it. But to give you a little background, let's talk about who HCD actually is. So HCD is a market and consumer research house. Um, we look at how consumers perceive, evaluate, and respond to different types of stimuli. Um, we use all sorts of different uh, tools from applied consumer neuroscience, including psychology and neuroscience tools, as well as traditional market research tools to really investigate how consumers interact with pa packages, products, communications, all these sorts of things. Um, we do these things online as well as in person and globally all over the world. We travel where the work needs to be done. Um, the work can be done on the early stages of product exploration and development, um, as well as what, all the way through to validation and final marketing. Um, and communication. So, so glad to have you join us as usual. And we have somebody with us. So let's, uh, let's talk about um, Glenn Kessler. So you probably saw him in last season or no, you probably saw no, him at some point. <laughs> oh yeah, you're coming up. We, we're going to be interviewing Glenn, but he's, uh, he's our president and CEO and fearless leader. Uh, Glenn, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I started my career at uh, Johnson & Johnson and then went to Hoffman LaRoche. I have a very old MBA from 1977, and there was nothing I learned then that I can apply to what I do now. Uh, started HCD 27 years ago as a traditional market research company and sort of t turned it into a communications research company uh, using online methods. And in 2009, 2010, uh, got involved with applied neuroscience and uh, used for communications. And uh, luckily, Michelle joined us a few years later and brought us into sensory research and communications. And you have a bit of a background in politics, right? Yeah. So in 2004 and 2008, I chose to uh, uh, try to get PR for our company and I suggested that maybe we should test every single presidential ad um, that uh, from the Bush and the Kerry um, campaign. And we uh, actually identified an ad that became somewhat famous called the Swift Boat ad. And uh, it became part of the 72 hour news cycle which brought us some attention and prominence as uh, experts in testing campaign advertising. And uh, did the same thing in 2008. And uh, we, were, we did routine uh, TV appearances in New York and Philadelphia uh, to review the data that we got, as well as uh, um, in 2012 and 2016, we had a small part, uh, but we did some research for the two campaigns, uh, the presidential campaigns. And uh, we decided what a time to try this using applied neuroscience. There is no other time like this campaign. And so uh, we decided to take some of our interests and skills in political communications testing and use it to test the debate. Great, so can you, uh, Michelle, just give us a little bit of an overview of how this project really came about, what it's about from a high level standpoint? So I think a lot of it comes from Glenn's, you know, strong interest in, in politics, but, you know, in, in talking about how we use this research in, um, in market research and consumer research, you know, we, we try to look at being able to uncover things that people can't say, right? 
So when you use neuroscience or psychology, it's really to try to get that added information that they can't just report in a survey. Um, and another aspect was is that we know that people experience things in one way, and they you might have you know in in industry work you might have that the brand manager is making decisions well when it comes to politics and it comes to things like these debate events it's the pundits that talk about it right glenn that's correct uh they do and uh, one additional thought michelle and when you ask somebody who won or who lost the debate they can't tell you using tools like we're uh, going to be discussing you know probably likely what caused them to have the feelings they did about a specific candidate's presentation. Mm -hmm. But what's so much of what shapes, you know, people, what they might report afterwards. So if you were to ask people after the debate, you know, what did you think of it? I mean, immediately following these debates, the pundits jump right in, right? And they're all discussing it and they're yelling at each other and they're saying like, oh no, this is the most important moment and so-and-so clearly won. And it really depends on who you're watching, you know, whether you're watching Fox News or CNN or MSNBC, you're going to get their message of what they want to tell you is important. And I think one of the big questions for me was, is there a difference between what people are actually experiencing in the moment versus what the influences are from the pundits? So if we were to just take the pundits out of the situation and be able to measure live what's going on, are we going to see that difference? Is there, you know, something different going on? in the moment that, that people are reacting to that maybe the pundits aren't picking up on. That's a really great thing to highlight. And I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, moving forward in the next slides, how we actually approach that. Yeah, and so this was really interesting. Um, we looked at the live debate. So really trying to see, well, what, what happened? Um, it, could we measure people in the moment? So along with a consortium of other market research companies, including IVP Research Labs, Shimmer Research Incorporated, and Schlesinger Group, uh, we were able to put this together by recruiting Trump voters, Biden voters, and undecided voters to a facility in Philadelphia and forcing them to watch the presidential debate um, while we hooked them up to see, you know, what was uh, their response. You know, and the response there was is really, consent forms. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. They, they consent forms. But, you know, none of us really wanted to watch the debate, right? <laughs> but, you know, so they sat and they watched it and we measured them second by second to see what their responses were. Now, in this case, we, we focused on GSR. Um, and it's kind of being blocked here, but what you can see is that uh, we are able to measure the type of response that people had in the different voter groups as they're watching. Um, you could see the, the yellow graph there is uh, the moderate GSR response. The red is the high GSR response. Now, GSR is galvanic skin response. And we talked about this in the past, Catherine. Um, do you want to give like kind of a little brief thing on what GSR is? Sure. Just really briefly, GSR is this measure of arousal. So it's uh, basically your sweat response to whatever uh, stimulus or exposure that you are viewing. Um, so it is commonly used in media, well, not in our field, it is commonly used with things like print ads or media testing to try to get an understanding of somebody's um, excitement levels, arousal levels, things along those lines. And I just want to ask now, why did we choose to use this for, for this political study? GSR was kind of the, the most simple measure to use. Also, it's very responsive. So um, as far as the time locking of, of when the response was to the event that happened, you know, so if somebody threw out an insult, we could see that response coming right up. So you can kind of see in these graphs, they're second by second and really dynamic. There's a lot of changes. You can see that, you know, when one of the candidates said something, there was a response immediately after. So that was the first reason. Um, secondly, it is really easy. So it was just wiring people up on the palm of their hand, as you can kind of see in the, the background there. Um, you know, it's just an electrode placed on the hand to measure that skin conductance to see if there are any changes there. It's very sensitive as well. Um, and we were also able to do this using the shimmer equipment, the Neuralink. Um, you can kind of see on the, the left-hand side there that people were, were spaced out because we are in the time of COVID and so people wore masks and they were placed apart. Um, and in, you know, across several different rooms. And so we were able to kind of look at that, um, that measure uh, simultaneously with a large group uh, by using the, the shimmer technology of Neuralink. 
So let's kind of jump into the results. Now we did look at, you know, the different voter groups and, and I, I have to ask, like, it was really hard um, finding undecided voters because this is kind of late in the day, you know, of the, the whole. Right, we're uh, coming in October, so <laughs> yeah. it's coming right around the corner. <laughs> so it's like, you know, just shortly before the election, so finding those undecided voters was, was kind of difficult. And so I'm going to kind of toss that to Glenn, what your thoughts were about, like being able to get these undecided voters and, and what, what your thoughts were on that. Well, a good source would have been funeral homes, because if you hadn't made a decision by the end of October, uh, the question is, are you still alive? But um, I think what we'll find is these people uh, may not be the most cognizant of what's going on in the world. I can't say that. It's just a personal perception that uh, those who have not made a decision uh, mm. so close in such a contentious election yeah. probably aren't that emotionally involved in it. Maybe they're not paying attention sort of thing. Right. Well, that means that these uh, debates are really important then because it is the opportunity for these final undecided voters to really get ed educated and, and make some, you know, quick decisions essentially on who they're going to eventually vote for. And that's a really good question too, because like, do these debates really move anyone? And I think we kind of saw that in the results and, you know, just in the surveys themselves, um, you can kind of see here that the, the Biden voters, they didn't move, you know, whether they were responding to Trump or whether they were responding to Biden or whether they thought it was insightful, there wasn't like a huge change for them. Um, undecided, however, you can see a big change just, you know, and what they said was, you know, did they see, um, did they feel more intensity towards voting for one or the other? Um, and they shifted more towards Biden. And they also said that the whole debate was more insightful um, than the other groups. And I thought that was really interesting, especially considering the neuro results we saw. So they were, they reported this. Um, and they were probably pretty happy to report it because, you know, there was a question, what in the world's going on with undecided voters? But what we found in the results was actually that undecided people were pretty uh, non-responsive, I guess would be. Wow. Yeah. So I think if we kind of go back to here, you can even see here that there's a lot of response going on for the, um, the other two voter groups, but the undecideds were a little bit lower in most of theirs. Um, but, you know, kind of looking over what did people respond to, we did find that all groups actually responded really strongly to this one moment where, and, and Glenn, you know, you, you were watching this, um, when Biden was answering about why he didn't get stuff done for the past 47 years, he took a pause, kind of like one of those pregnant pauses, right? And then he said, because there was a Republican Congress, and he said it very calmly, and so it wasn't a very exciting moment but there was a huge reaction among all the voter groups. And I found that really interesting. Yeah, I agree. Um, <laughs> and I think you made a point earlier in some of our discussions together um, and that it may have been possibly due to the way he presented it. Again, in an environment where people are interrupting and yelling, he did it very calmly and uh, he made a terse statement that people understood and he delivered it in a way that brought up close to a climax um, as he was speaking. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting way to describe it. I think, you know, especially when you compare it to the first debate where it was just a bunch of yelling um, and there was certainly a lot of activity and people started to get tired towards the end of the first debate that when we were measuring that. But in this one, you know, things were a little bit more clear perhaps um, and you had a chance to really hear things out. and. I think that sort of pregnant pause was really effective in that sense. It seems like it was impactful. And I, I find it really interesting that you, you bring up the, the performance of it because that does have an effect. It's not just what you say, but how you say it exactly. um, will you know, influence our, the voters and the viewers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now we did see differences among the different voter groups as well. So when, Trump voters were watching, and this is one of those things that's kind of expected, but they reacted more towards Trump's jabs, right? So they, they stuck with their candidate and they were excited by what he was saying. Um, in particular, they really reacted to his, you know, Biden living in a basement comment. They 
reacted to when he was interrupting, you know, once again, talking about the different accounts in China, um, about knowing the law, about catch and release, and saying that Biden didn't know the law. So again, like very shit much jabbing. Um, when he made that big statement about being the least racist person in the room, that was a huge reaction from the Trump crowd. Um, discussing black men in jail and discussing why Biden didn't get anything done, as, as we mentioned before, you know, they were part of that reaction. But that's quite different um, than Biden voters, right? So Biden voters tended to react towards Biden's job more strongly. Um, you know, so, you, you know, you see this very big division, you know, they were reacting to discussions of Trump's tax returns and, um, you know, definitely when, when Trump said that, you know, people with the lowest IQ came back. Um, they reacted to that, um, saying he's the least, least racist person in the room and the pausing and climate change. So it's interesting that they got a bigger reaction towards the climate change discussion um, and also as well as the positive messages about like promising hope when Biden was really talking about that. That seemed to have a big effect. Glenn, did you have thoughts about how the Biden voters were reacting? Um, I was, I thought that as in the first debate, which we also studied, that um, they may have responded a bit more, maybe use the word granularly, that um, there was a, more of a response to some issue type questions rather than drama. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions, but um, yeah. I, I seem to gather that they were more focused on issues rather than the, uh, the theatrics. That's an interesting point, yeah. Yeah, it seems like the voters, or I should say, yeah, the viewers were really there to get a better understanding of the, you know, different topics that are important to them. So it would make sense that, um, you know, this list here does involve mm -hmm. a lot of those, you know, ideas. And that's essentially the, the point of these debates is so that they can articulate their ideas yeah. um, for, for the people. And not just the things that end up being printed immediately on t-shirts, right? So I think a lot of like the, the jabbing funny comments from the first debate were immediately made into something, right? They were made into memes, they were made into t-shirts. Not so much for this, this last one, but there was like big reaction to things that seemed to have a little more substance to your point, Glenn. And when we look at the Biden and Trump voters together, the overlap seemed to be over the comment about being the least, least racist in the room and that big pause. So those would be the, the big moments that I would say um, from this debate. And I think that um, a lot of the pundit focus se seemed to be really on that least racist in the room idea. And a lot of the memes seem to center around that and not so much, you know, about Biden's really effective pause there. And I think that maybe that could have used some more attention. What are your thoughts, Glenn? Yes, um, and that's a really good example of how uh, media can sometimes focus on the drama uh, relevant, as opposed to substance. <clears throat> and the issue of uh, Republican Congress slowing down possibly Biden's actions over his uh, years as vice president um, suggests you have to be more focused on the politics of it. Whereas uh, Trump's least racist comment is for some people inflammatory and some people it's positive. And uh, so they're very different statements. And it's interesting that both of them uh, got the arousal um, by the voters. Uh, and it is not surprising that the least racist in the room comment was the one that was picked up by the media and played over and over because of the associated drama. It's a nice sound bite too, right? Having oh, someone do a, a pregnant pause doesn't really work into like a, a sound bite or a t-shirt. Or me. <laughs> <Yep. Yep. laughs> <laughs> now these undecided people, um, now they were quite different from everybody else and mainly because they didn't have huge reactions. Like their, their graph stayed pretty much on the bottom. They had sort of little reactions, not, not as large as um, the Trump and Biden voters, but they did have some reaction to when Trump was making fun of Biden as the big man, um, when he was, when Biden was denying his, his family involvement, um, 
Trump's jabbing, the moderator switching, you know, so some of the, it, it seemed to be kind of all over the place. I didn't see anything that was like as concrete um, of reactions as you saw from the decided voters. Um, so undecided kind of had this muted reaction where they almost seemed kind of uninterested. The things they did react to uh, didn't seem to align on particularly other, either side. So they do truly seem undecided, perhaps because they are less interested. What are your thoughts, Glenn? Well, actually, there was one of those moments, and that was uh, the denying families involvement in uh, broad issues, where Biden used a sort of a drama tool. He looked at the camera, mm -hmm. he extended his arms, and he said, you, knew, you know who I am, and you know who he is, and you know where I come from, and he added drama. And that was one of the moments that uh, we identified as stirring the undecideds. And uh, I think he used that a few times. I thought it was kind of interesting that that one moment where it really, mm -hmm. uh, I really saw that happen and remembered it after the debate yeah. uh, was one of those moments that those uh, undecideds reacted to. That's really interesting. So I think a lot of the attention and reaction that Trump was able to get was through these jabs, right? Through making some um, criticisms, right? And some funny statements. Whereas, you know, when you look at the, um, the other things going on that seems maybe a little more dramatic in a different sense, behavioral, right? So the pregnant pause Biden did that he was able to like go like this and address, you know, go like this a lot. Like he was talking to the viewers, which has a quite different effect um, we definitely saw that a lot in the first debate where Trump was talking to Biden um, and Biden was talking to the viewers, right? That's an excellent point to bring up, Michelle, right. because it does make it a bit more reflective on the viewer when you're seeing it, whereas um, you're being spoken to rather than you're just mm -hmm. witnessing something as a third party. And that would have, you know, a behavioral difference, which clearly has reflected in the data. Just yeah. a, reminds me of uh, how I sort of positioned them. Uh, the president um, considers himself, and many do, as a negotiator, where he focuses pretty much one-on-one. -on -one. Biden is a conciliator, and so he's talking to the group. And if you look at how they behaved in both of the debates, um, it sort of was like that. Uh, president yeah. was talking to Biden. Biden was talking to the audience. And you don't see a lot of discussion about that, those sort of behavioral tactics in a debate um, from the pundits. They were talking more about these big moments, right? right. Um, but when we look at the tactics, we can actually see that come out in the neuro responses where people were reacting to those types of things. And I think that's yep. pretty interesting. Yep, body language speaks volumes. Absolutely. So where do we think we can take this sort of approach of being able to measure people um, you know, there's, a, there's some interesting things that have been happening as far as like moving to digital, um, just the, the effect of negative ads, um, how you better communicate with people on social media. I think there's something to understanding how best to communicate. So not only having something that ends up being a funny jab or a funny meme, but what is most effective, right? You know, yes. And I think that uh, you can't tell by polling, and polling is a prominent uh, way of assessing how your campaign is going, but it's retrospective, uh, as well as focus groups, which provide ideas for messaging. Those are the main tools uh, that uh, political groups use. But understanding the nuances by a target segment, voter groups, uh, a negative ad for one group of supporters could be a positive ad for another group and vice versa. Um, and you only know that if you can identify how they feel rather than just how they say they liked the ad. Right. And why do you find that as a benefit, Glenn? Well, um, first of all, it may give you an answer to the question, why did they feel as they did? What was it about that ad that made them like it or not like it? And that allows you to go into segments of the ad and find things that worked 
that caught attention, that, um, that mm. made people um, excited versus those that were less so and allows you to repeat those moments in other communications uh, with the assumption that they're gathering attention, gathering uh, interest. And uh, so that you can really surgically uh, identify what caught the voters and then replicate it in fu future communications. Mm -hmm. And across Listen. platforms as well, right? Because, you know, I think if, if campaigns are gonna be successful, they're gonna have to understand how to best communicate with their base and, and their potential voters across different platforms, right? They need to do it through influencers. So you can see on the left, you know, there's influences there, influencers there that have been really big in consumer, and they're absolutely very big in politics as well. Um, but also being able to translate a message from Instagram to Snapchat. I think that making sure you're still having the right effect on the right people is also really important. And maybe you just made me think of something. Often uh, there are surrogates and luminaries that mm -hmm. politicians will bring on to represent them. But I wonder if the campaigns have looked at the impact of those personalities on the segment of voters that they need to convince. Mm -hmm. If they're using these luminaries to make the people who are already going to vote for them feel good, yeah. um, doesn't and do And is it congruent? Is it on brand? You know, we do that right. a lot of that work when we do um, our market research, right? Where we make sure that the product is congruent with the branding. And so if you have a surrogate, that person's messaging and how they're presenting in that ad or that share or whatever it might be, needs to be congruent with what you're, you're trying to accomplish overall, especially for that particular segment that you're looking at. So I think, you know, a lot of people just try to throw stuff out there when it comes to political advertising and just see what sticks or what not. But I think people can be a lot more surgical, as you said, Glenn, and a lot more effective if they really take into consideration the sort of behavioral decision science of, around how people react to things. You just made me think I had a vision of Alice Cooper campaigning for Pence. It's not congruent. Right. <laughs> yes. Perhaps that's not congruent. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, thank, thank you, Glenn, for, for joining us and talking about fun. this really fun research. And, you know, for those of you that joined us on this, thank you so much. And please make sure to subscribe to the channel. Subscribe, like, comment. Um, and join us for future uh, vidcasts as well as to check out some of our previous ones. You can also uh, contact us in lots of different ways. Link with us on LinkedIn. Um, you know, subscribe, like, and comment to, to our YouTube channel. You can email any of us across here. Uh, tweet with us at HDB Neuroscience and visit our blog and website to see what's new in consumer neuroscience and applied consumer neuroscience to see how we're using all of this stuff and maybe see other updates on our political neuro stuff. Um, so again, thank you so much and we hope to see you next time. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Looking thank forward you. to seeing you.